Good morning. I'm Mike DeBonis. I'm a congressional reporter with The Post. I'm joined now by two senators who have seen their states affected by the opioid crisis and are working to find solutions. Please join me in welcoming Senator Maggie Hassan and Senator Rob Portman. Mike. Uh, we also have Senator Joe Manchin, who is hoping to join us today. He's been delayed a little bit. Perhaps uh, he'll, he'll be joining us a little later, but we're just delighted to have uh, two leaders uh, in, this, in this sphere who have uh, been working every day. Uh, Senator Maggie Hassan is in her first term representing New Hampshire. Her, her efforts to uh, combat opi excuse me, opioid abuse did not start in January. During her four years as, as governor, she worked across party lines to secure funding to strengthen prevention, treatment, recovery, and law enforcement efforts in her state. New Hampshire increased penalties for fentanyl distribution, began investigating opioid uh, overdose deaths as homicides, reformed the state's prescribing rules, and expanded the state's prescription drug monitoring system. She's a member of the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and she's a co-sponsor of multiple bills to address the epidemic. Senator Rob Portman uh, of Ohio, delighted to have you here. Uh, Senator Portman's in his second term representing Ohio. He's a former director of the Office of Management and Budget, former U.S. Trade Representative. He's one of Congress's foremost experts on fiscal and trade matters, but he's also had a long interest in combating drug abuse dating back to his days as a House member. Uh, he established an anti-drug coalition in his hometown of Cincinnati. He's the author of the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, which is the first major reform of federal addiction policy in two decades, which was signed into law last year. And he's chairman of the, of the Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, where he's done some significant intensive oversight on the response to the epidemic. Thank you, Senator Portman, for being with us today. And to those watching, I want to invite you to please tweet your questions at us. We, we're, we're collecting them under the hashtag postlive. So hashtag postlive, send us your questions. We'd be delighted to uh, answer those. Uh, let me start with, uh, you know, I'm, you know, as a as a member of the post, uh, uh, when we have a, an investigation that's had as, an impact as we saw on Sunday, um, it's important to address that. And I want to I want to ask you both, but uh, we learned, uh, you know, through this investigation, most of us, a lot of us, uh, that Congress acted last year. Uh, passing a bill that key figures of the DA say took tools away from them that they needed to combat this epidemic. Both of you are, are authors of legislation that aim to stop the epidemic and help its victims. When did you learn about the effects of this particular bill and what's your reaction to knowing that you, you may have, you know, in your case, Senator Portman, you were in, in Congress when this happened, that you may have played a part in supporting a bill that may have exacerbated the crisis. And ju just so people understand, this is a bill that passed by unanimous consent, Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, any one senator could have stopped the bill, but it seems that there was just not a, a, uh, an understanding of what this, uh, the impacts of this bill would be. S senator Portman, I I'd ask you to start. Yeah, oh, thanks to the Post, I learned about it. And, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's true, with, I, I would assume you know, if not all, most of my colleagues. Um, you know, it's a complicated issue, um, opioids, and it requires a comprehensive response, obviously, and that's why the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act last year was landmark legislation, as you said, because it covers the, the whole gamut. Um, some of the legislation actually got weakened uh, in a conference with the House mm -hmm. on the prescription drug area, uh, which is why we've reintroduced legislation that's actually a little stronger than our original push that got knocked out in the House on prescription drug monitoring. And uh, Maggie is a co-sponsor of that bill. Uh, Amy Klobuchar and I are the co-authors. Um, I think on this particular one, um, I mean, I frankly, you know, asked my office, did we hear from anybody? And the right. answer was no. And the irony is that it actually passed the Judiciary Committee. I'm not on the Judiciary Committee, but it went through the Judiciary Committee uh, at the same time as the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. So I think a lot of the focus was probably on the opioid crisis and the prevention, education, treatment, recovery, and Narcan, uh, which is the miracle drug that reverses the effects of overdoses, that focus was on the 
Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, and that may have been, you know, one of the reasons this sort of slipped through because apparently it was unanimous consent in committee, unanimous consent on the floor. Um, but obviously, that's one of the issues that we need to now relook at. We need to go right. back and examine that. I did look this morning at what the DEA enforcement actions were around that time, and they were significantly reduced before the legislation was passed. So mm -hmm. there was actually already um, a pullback of that of the enforcement actions. But you know, it's a again, it's it's a very complicated issue. There's no silver bullet. There's no one way to address this issue that will solve the crisis because it is a crisis. Right. We just got to meet the family coming out who we saw briefly uh, uh, here and. Maggie and I have, I mean, I've met with probably, you know, a thousand addicts, recovering addicts in the last couple of years alone. I focus a lot on that issue, but right. everybody has. Um, so I, I think you have to start with the drug companies coming up with a non-addictive pain medication. Uh, there was a task force recently established under CARA, the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act by the administration. In fact, um, applications are being accepted now for people to be on that task force. We need to push the drug companies to come up with non-addictive alternatives. I mean, it's crazy that we're using opioids for things like extracting a wisdom tooth. Sure. It just it doesn't make any sense. And then the distribution network, which is the focus of that story, is obviously a huge part of it. The Prescription Drug Monitoring Act uh, that, again, I encourage members to co-sponsor and let's get the darn thing passed, requires states to have a prescription drug monitoring program that holds the pharmacies and the doctors mm -hmm. responsible on the prescription side to stop the overprescribing. It also requires states to get involved with the interstate compacts so that you have interoperability. In Ohio, yep. people get the prescription in Ohio, then they go to West Virginia or Kentucky or Michigan or Indiana or Kentucky somewhere else to get another prescription filled. We've got to stop that. And then obviously on the treatment and recovery side, Narcan and the enforcement side. And yep. uh, we have another bill, Maggie and I, and Again, it's a bipartisan bill that deals with how do you keep the illegal drugs from right. going in. And I, I want to certainly talk about the STOP Act a little later. Senator Hassan, let me ask you, what, what's your reaction to these revelations? I know that uh, you have some tough questions and had some tough questions for the DEA. Um, you would expect the agency that's enforcing, enforcing these laws to speak up when Congress is about to act to take tools out of their toolbox. What's your reaction to what happened here? Well, well, first of all, um, as is true with Rob, I have been um, meeting with and hearing from uh, families, uh, people who have struggled with addiction, people who have lost people to addiction uh, ever since I got into office, but particularly over the last three to four years in New Hampshire, the epidemic has just spread like wildfire. And um, part of what we see in the story that, that you all broke is the structural underpinnings of this epidemic. And while it is very true that we have been focused on prevention, treatment, recovery, law enforcement, um, one of the other things I did as governor was with Republican colleagues in the legislature stand up Medicaid expansion so that people could actually get treatment. It's a critical part of the Affordable Care Act uh, that also requires private insurers to cover substance misuse disorder. So while we have been focusing on what I would call uh, getting resources to the front lines, and we needed to do much, much more on that. Um, the structural underpinnings of this epidemic are much harder to crack because of the various forces involved. So I'm along with Senator McCaskill and Senator Manchin. Uh, I'm on a bill that we filed, I think it was yesterday, to repeal the law that passed by unanimous consent now that we understand what the impact really has been. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think that one of the things that has been a real challenge here is that there are all these structural components. There is a pharmaceutical industry that encouraged doctors to treat pain as a vital sign and use opioids um, aggressively. Uh, there are doctors who obviously, the vast majority of them, trained to help people alleviate pain, save lives. So uh, they were, I think, somewhat resistant at the beginning to think that they had a role in this, so changing prescribing rules was difficult. We have drug companies making enormous amounts of money on these drugs, and then we have um, an epidemic in which the uh, people who are suffering from the disease are stigmatized. And I really do think if this were an epidemic 
uh, that what did not carry the stigma that substance use disorder does, we might have gotten at these structural issues sooner. So we still have a lot of work to do, and we still have to push incredibly hard, uh, in addition to asking and encouraging and providing incentives for drug companies to find non-addictive pain relief. We also have a medical device industry that actually does have some non-addictive alternatives mm -hmm. for pain treatment, but they can't get coverage through things like Medicare and Medicaid yeah. for those. So well, there's true. a lot of work to do. Um, I just will also just say how grateful I am, not only from the family we just heard from, but throughout my state, throughout Rob's state, around the country, yep. people suffering from addiction and their families have stood up. Parents have begun to write breathtakingly difficult obituaries about their children. Mm -hmm. They have brought attention to this by being willing to stand up and talk about their pain, their suffering, and this disease, and that's what's going to make a difference yep. ultimately. That's how we're going to beat this thing. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Well, we are joined to, uh, by Senator Joe Manchin. Hey, Joe. Hey. How you doing, buddy? Joe, how you doing? Good, good to you. <laughs> Traffic was horrible. <laughs> how are you? Good. Thanks, Senator. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, three is always, uh, you know, always great to have a trio with us. Uh, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to, to Senator Manchin, uh, who's represented w West Virginia in the Senate since 2010. He's worked tirelessly to bring attention to the toll of the opioid crisis in his state well before the national dimensions of the epidemic became known. He's uh, among the efforts that he's been involved in. He was a, a, a leader in the effort to get hydrocodone rescheduled, a very powerful I can opioid. Mike and Lord tab from Schedule Three, Schedule Two. Right, and that that that's meant uh, a, a, quite a dramatic decrease in the number of uh, prescriptions for that particular drug. Uh, he's uh, co-sponsored a number of bills related to the crisis. He's a co-founder of the Prescription Drug Abuse Caucus, and he talks about this almost every single day. Let's be honest, every single day you're talking to constituents, you're talking about this issue. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Senator, I know that you saw the report that yeah. we had in the paper on Sunday. Thank you. Uh, uh, that we did with 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you've spoken out about it. You, yeah. you, you called for uh, representation Senator Marino to, to, to withdraw his name. Um, let me ask you this, though, because I gave Senator Portman a little bit of a hard time here before you, uh, you showed up, but you, too, were in the Senate last year when sure. this bill passed by unanimous consent. What was your reaction when you learned, oh. as the author of a, of a number of bills to address this epidemic, that you may have let a bill through that may have made it worse? We were incensed because when you look at the, the whole timeline, 2014, Congressman Marino put a piece of legislation in the House it had great uh, uh, resistance from, uh, uh, from the DEA and the DOJ, saying it would harm their ability to do the job they're supposed to do. They re back and reshuffled a little bit more. They hired people from the, uh, that were, uh, and the DEA, which is Mr. Barber, uh, Lyndon Barber, was able to write and smooth it over. And then it went through, no objections whatsoever from the House in 2015. Came over to the Senate, it came into the Senate. And they worked on the language some more to make it smoother, and there's no objections. A UC means that basically if it comes out of the committee, the signed committee, and there's no one, if we're not on those committees, and our staff's not intricately involved in it, we rely on the agency. So if the DEA and the DOJ said, uh, we think this will not harm them whatsoever, we just want to make sure that the patients that are in severe pain, end of life, cancer, are going to get what they want, we never intended to remove them from it, but it was never intended to be a wholesale market to open up the floodgates because in West Virginia, the floodgates were already open. Uh, I have one little town, Kermit, West Virginia, 392 people, 9 million pills in one pharmacy. Now you tell me something wasn't flagged there and why it shouldn't have been flagged. So they're all, everybody's at fault here. Uh, how do you stop it? Well, right. you stop it by getting the enforcement people back to do their job. Do you stop them from going from one, uh, from the DO, DEA the people that know what to look for and how to investigate and how to prosecute from the DOJ and prevent them from going into the pharmaceutical industry business within the same week right. and get a big paycheck. And just to be clear, this is not, this is not a partisan <laughs> failure. Oh, this this is, is had Republicans and Democrats co-sponsored. Uh, President Rob's Obama much, signed this he's bill. He's got as much problems in Ohio as I have yep. in West Virginia as Maggie has in New Hampshire. Uh, this is, this is a, it's been a silent killer and it doesn't have partisanship. Uh, it's Democrats, Republicans, independents, doesn't care about who you are, it'll get you. And we keep our mouths shut because as family members, we were afraid to, to embarrass anybody or embarrass ourselves. 
So every family member I know and everybody in this audience probably knows somebody that has been affected. Yeah. Before we move on, I want to ask one last question yeah. to each of you. What needs to be done to, to fix this? Should this, this bill, the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act, be repealed or at least the, 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 the provision in question here? Would you support? Would you all support that? And uh, what are you willing to do to make sure that happens? Well, well? First of all, we've already co-sponsored it uh, with, uh, uh, with Claire McCaskill right now, and, and I'm sure it's going to be a bipartisan yeah. effort. No one intended for this to happen. Senator Portman? You... I was happy to see uh, this morning that the Judiciary Committee agreed to hold a hearing, and that's the first step toward addressing the issue. It's got to be reexamined, and it will be. Um, and I think it will be bipartisan, as Joe says. Uh, so that hearing will take place soon, as I understand it. And Again, when I looked at the data this morning, yeah. the enforcements were already down before the legislation passed. So it's a deeper problem than just the, the standard of proof, which is what changed in that legislation. Yeah. I mean, there needs you, to be, you know, and this was in the Obama administration, now we're in a new administration, but it's the same career people there who need to be given the tools to be able to do their job. And do you see, uh, I, I just would sure. say that, there, to, to Rob's point, it seems that there was this concerted effort by the industry to get the DEA to kind of work, quote, with them. Uh, the administrative law judge, who you uh, all uh, cited in your reports, uh, I read some of his article yesterday, and he said the language just about makes it impossible. Right. And so now that we've got a judge in charge of interpreting the law saying the language, yeah. whatever it was intended to do, this shouldn't have been this is this is result. just under so people understand. Yeah. This is the person whose job it is right. to interpret the regulations and say mm -hmm. what they what they do and what they don't say. Um, as you learned in your hearing in the health committee yesterday, the DEA takes a different view. Even though well, not, uh, this was the industry when I asked the me, industry, yeah, the industry whether uh, the judge was wrong who said that the, the law not made it impossible to yeah. to really inf bring enforcement actions, suspend shipments uh, of opioids. Um, the, the judge said it was impossible. I asked the industry about it yesterday. They said the judge was wrong and they weren't misleading the public. So we've got some work to do. Well, the whole, the, the, you know, the, the phrase was that, uh, <coughs> the substitute amendment was a substantial likelihood of immediate threat. Yeah. Changed everything. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, Senator Portman, I just want to follow up with you. Do you think with, with you, you chair an oversight committee, the, the permanent subcommittee on investigations, do you see some opportunities? I know you've done a lot of work on opioids. Uh, do you see any opportunities on this particular issue to, uh, to step in, or are there other committees looking at this? Well, Judiciary is going to look at it. They've already made the decision to. They've got the jurisdiction. Uh, but sometimes we manage to prod those committees to mm -hmm. be a little more aggressive. And we have done a lot in this area, um, so it would not be inappropriate. Let's see what the Judiciary Committee does. I think this will move pretty quickly. There are, there are other things to do, too, uh, in addition to this, obviously. Right. Um, and I don't know if that's... Well, we're, yeah, let's, let's move on. I think one thing that's out there I think we're all at least somewhat familiar with is that there's a White House commission looking at this. Yeah have been looking at this for a number of months. They're due to put out a final report by the end of the month. Uh, but we already know they've made, they made interim recommendations in July, one of which was to declare the national emergency. Um, that's something that got a lot of attention at the time. It hasn't happened yet. We heard the, the president earlier this week sort of indicate that that may be happening soon. Can we talk about the, that, that declaration of a na national emergency? What does it mean? What doesn't it mean? How important is it? Or is it sort of shorthand for, for other things that need to be done? Well, we've been, we've been waiting for details on what the president and the commission actually mean, because uh, as Joe knows as a former governor like me, the type of emergency you declare matters in terms of what resources you then can actually deploy. And so we've been waiting for details from the White House. Uh, it was very disappointing that uh, the president said we were going to declare a national emergency, which I assume meant, and then really garner some resources, because while the uh, CARE Act really, uh, CARE and Cures really uh, helped us get some resources out in the field, they aren't nearly enough. Um, and we've talked to the commission, too, about the distribution formula. New Hampshire has one of the highest per capita rates of deaths from overdoses in the country, but we only got $3 million of the money of the $500 uh, million. But um, at the end of the day, this administration has said that it cares a lot about this and then just not followed through, and we are losing people every day. Let, let, if I may say that, you know, in my state, I am the highest. Uh, I have more deaths per capita than any state. 
and it's affected every area of my state in southern West Virginia and the coal fields most uh, uh, direly got, got hit hard. So, you know, I, I go around and, and I, uh, being governor, former governor, now being in my position of the U.S. Senate, and uh, seeing the devastation that's going on, how do you affect it? Well, no one has treatment centers. First of all, we were all in, uh, we were all in denial, uh, thinking that if you were addicted, you know, you were a criminal. We're going to put you away. Well, we did that yeah. for 20, 30 years. We never cured anybody. And so now we understand, and those who are not naysayers or deniers, that uh, addiction is an ailment, and an ailment needs treatment. And if you don't have treatment centers, forget about it. You're not going to cure the people. So we're, going to, we're starting in West Virginia. We have to start with pre-K, pre-K up as far as education in schools, mm -hmm. what this does. We have no place to put the children. We take them out of a drug-infested home. Foster care is almost impossible to get. So we're talking, we have people talking about uh, orphanages again to try to get them out of a drug-infested home. How do you clean the person up if you don't have treatment centers? So I introduced a bill called Lifeboat. One, I'm going to charge the manufacturers that can't pass the cost on one penny per milligram for every milligram they produce of opiates in the United States of America. That produces one and a half to two billion dollars. One and a half to one penny. And they're not going to be able to pass that through. Everybody says it'll be a tax increase. It's not. It's a treatment. And we can start putting these treatment centers and helping people in the most right. infested areas. And the second one, we can't get people into the workforce. I'm down to 50% of my adult working age people are able to work because three things keep you out of the workforce. You either have addiction, uh, you have uh, uh, incarceration uh, or a record, conviction, or you have lack of skill sets or combination. Well, I can tell you, if you're addicted, you're going to end up with a criminal record. You're probably larceny. And then we have no way to get them back in because we put them in jail. So I said, if it's not a criminal, if it's not a violent crime or a sexual crime, a person goes through one year of treatment and passes, one year of mentoring, helping other people, they ought to have a right to go back to their sentencing judge to see if they can have that one-time expungion. Right. Senator Portman, I want to ask you this because you've been outspoken and saying it's not just about the laws and it's not just about the, the regulations, it's about the funding. You've, you've worked to try and get the funding uh, in place. Some of that was done in CARA, some of that was done in 21st Century Cures, another bill that passed last year, but you've said there's more to be done. Uh, how does declaring an emergency help or is the bigger you know, issue getting Congress to act, appropriating money to, to, to actually get people the help they need? Uh, I think it's both. I mean, what's happened in the last uh, year and a half is really positive. Uh, Congress did pass the CARE legislation. It took us four years to put it together and to get the support for it. Uh, you know, we had conferences here in D.C. You brought best practices from all around the country. It's the first time Congress has ever acted as an example to fund recovery programs. To uh, the, the point that Maggie and Joe made, this is not you know, going to be solved with only one approach. It's got to be multifaceted. It has to include, in my view, not just treatment, but long-term recovery. And so that, that's what this legislation does. And as Maggie said, it does provide grants to the states. It's, uh, we actually overfunded it this year, and that was a really good sign. I mean, my concern was we weren't going to provide enough funding, given all the budget mm -hmm. pressures. We actually funded more than was authorized. We'll take some more. And we, and we need more. Sure. And yes. then, and that was in the last year, and now we've passed the Cures Act also. The Cures is different because it sends the money directly to the states. Yeah. So CARA can go directly. For instance, we just had three grants in Ohio uh, that were announced that are going to nonprofits and going directly to service providers. But Cures goes directly to the states. That's a half a billion dollars a year. Um, that's for this year and next year, but then nothing beyond that. So we're going to have to be sure we get that $500 million again in this fiscal year, get as much as we can, because the crisis is not getting better, it's getting worse. And then we've got to be sure that we have a longer-term strategy. Some of us have been working on that to try to figure out mm -hmm. how do you have something that's more permanent so states can plan. But it, all, all that's going to be needed. So the commission... <coughs> Uh, I think did a good interim report. You know, I've testified before and talked to them. Uh, I, I spoke to Governor Christie over the weekend again uh, mm -hmm. about the final report. I think he's passionate about this and committed to it. He's the chair of the commission, as you know. And, um, you know, I, I, actually the report was due on October 1st. Uh, right. So they, asked, they asked for an extension. They asked for an extension, and, and that's, that's fine. I just want to be sure that they do meet the end of the month deadline. Right. And and Governor I, Christie, made, that's his intention? That that's he, his intention. And again, he, he's passionate about this. And, you know, he's got, uh, you know, a personal commitment to this that is impressive. But I, I got to tell you, I, I don't think the national emergency is as important mm -hmm. as, you know, sort of what results in terms of Congress. Because the administration can't appropriate right. money. What they can do, and this is positive, and I, I 
have met with the President personally on this very issue, um, is they can declare an emergency that requires all the agencies to work better together. So I mentioned the interagency task force on coming up with new non-prescript, non-addictive pain medication. If the agencies yeah. are all told by the top, this is, this is an epidemic, which it is, uh, this is a national emergency, it'll make a difference, and that's good. Yep. But Congress has to also view this as an emergency, and you know, that, that requires us to do a better job of providing some longer-term funding here, uh, and not just funding. It's not a matter of throwing money after the issue. It's a matter of finding what works. Right. And again, what CARA did after four years of study is, you know, what kind of treatments work better than others? The need for longer-term recovery was evident sure. from all the research we did. The need for us to deal with this issue at every level. We're going to talk about the Stop Act in a second, yep. I hope. But there are more people dying in Ohio today, and I think the same is true, Joe, with your state, from fentanyl than from heroin. Sure. Mm -hmm. And fentanyl is a synthetic form of opioids that's coming in from right. China mostly, coming in by the U.S. mail. That's an outrage. We've got to deal right. with that. And, and unbelievably, the STOP Act, which Maggie and I have worked on for about a year now, has been stuck yep. in Congress. What's, uh, d d before we move on to the STOP Act, I, I do want to save, we got a couple questions coming in from our viewers that I want to get to eventually. But what, absolutely, let's talk about the STOP Act. Senator Hassan. You know, fentanyl is, is, as we're learning every day, is an incredibly powerful drug that's, that's uh, you know, it, it's, it's killed people. It's, it's affected innumerable lives. Um, and we have this problem that it, right. it simply is coming in through the mail from overseas. Talk about the problem and what the STOP Act. Well, uh, so address. in New Hampshire, 70% uh, or so of our overdose deaths are a result of fentanyl. Um, overdoses. And so it is uh, 50 times more powerful than heroin. We've also had 10 deaths from carfentanil, which is 100 times more powerful than fentanyl and was really intended only to tranquilize large elephants. So um, these drugs are synthetic. The profit margins, because they're easy to make, you don't have to grow a plant as a precursor here, um, are huge, and they are flooding particularly rural areas uh, of our country. Um, I do just want to add one other thing to the overall picture here of what we need to do. The last thing we should be doing is destabilizing and repealing our health care uh, in this country in terms of making sure that there is treatment accessible to people who need it. So in this mix, while we talk about the STOP Act, which is critically important uh, to getting data so that we can go after these fentanyl producers and dealers, uh, we can't ignore the fact that an integrated health care system that treats behavioral health and substance use disorder is an absolutely essential piece of this. And if we repeal the Affordable Care Act, if we cut Medicaid substantially, if we fail to invest in long-term treatment and have a variety of treatment modalities for people, we will not turn the tide on this thing and beat it. Senator Portman, uh, quickly, I mean, uh, the STOP Act, it seems like a no-brainer that uh, we, we would want to crack down on, on, on something like this. Why is it so difficult to keep to, for Congress to act to, to change the law to keep these, uh, these very powerful drugs? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the I, I can tell you the reasons, but it's a mystery to me because here's what's going on, and, and this is a shock when people find out. Fentanyl, which is, again, killing more people in our states than heroin now, is coming in through the U.S. mail. Yeah. I mean, th this is not coming overland from Mexico like heroin. Um, and it's not even coming from a country next to us. It is coming mostly from China. And they choose the U.S. mail because the U.S. mail system does not require that packages have information on it for law enforcement to be able to stop this poison. If you're FedEx, UPS, DHL, you've got to provide advanced data that says this is where it's from, this is what's in it, this is where it's going. Law enforcement, and I've been to the DHL screening and the UPS screening, I've seen them do it. They go in there with the Customs and Border Protection people and DEA, and DEA is strongly supportive of our efforts, by the way, and they're able to identify these packages. It's like finding a needle in a haystack if they don't have that information. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you can get a package, you know, the size of that clock uh, that right. can have 100,000 doses in it. Yep. You know, three cr flakes of this stuff can, can kill you. This is incredibly powerful, incredibly cheap, and at a minimum, <laughs> we ought to be giving our law enforcement officials the ability to find these packages and stop them. That's not, again, that's not the only solution here because 
that'll increase the cost and get a little bit less on the street, but we still have to deal with the broader issue. Yep. But that is well, a no-brainer. I do, I I do want to turn to, and Senator Manchin, I want you to feel this. This is a, a question from a viewer. Uh, Jasmine asks on Twitter, to what extent is harsher punishments for fentanyl a solution to the broader crisis? And I know there's bills out there. Senator Feinstein, I know, has one that, that are involved in the in the uh, in that aspect. I, I'm fine with anything that and, does work, and if it's more effective, the bottom line is, unless we do something with the Chinese government, and they get serious about shutting this thing down. Right. They know yeah. where it's. We all know where it's coming from. They know where it's coming from. And until Wilbur Ross, the Department of Commerce, and this administration get serious in trade and everything that we do, and all the pressures we can put, sanctions, that we can tell them how serious. We're not going to let them keep killing Americans. They've and, got to know that this is serious, right. and we are not standing for it, and we're not going to tolerate it. We can shut everything down. We can try to stop the, the flood, uh, if you will. But unless the Chinese government is real and gets real about this and sincere, knowing that we're sincere and that we're going to do everything we can through sanctions and trade agreements and everything that we can to put pressure on them, you know, if there's no quid pro quo uh, uh, right. offense to those, they'll keep, the money keeps pouring in, they'll keep doing it. Mike, those two indictments this week of yeah. Chinese nationals um, as traffickers are yeah, really significant mm -hmm. yeah. because that's the first time that the Justice Department has taken that right. stand. And they don't issue those indictments lightly. No. Yeah. So uh, finally, it's we're moving in the right direction. People. It's just moving too slow. Right. right. And, and, and the, 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 there is absolutely a criminal ju justice aspect to this here. Um, Senator Manchin, I think you've been sort of outspoken in saying you, you can't incarcerate your, way, incarcerate your way out of this pro problem. You have to treat this as the illness that it is. Um, there's another very interesting question here coming to us from a viewer, Victoria, on Twitter. Asks, what do senators think about uh, establishing safe injection sites to help curb the crisis? In other words, giving addicts a place where they can go yeah. and be monitored while they uh, well, use. I, I mean, we've heard about uh, you know other harm reduction, risk reduction strategies like needle exchange, et cetera. Is, is this something that, that's worth exploring? Well, let, me just, let me just talk about methadone suboxone, okay? Uh, we have certain people that recommend this is how you should bring them down. And we have other people says, absolutely not. I'm an addict. All you're doing is extending them. You're just stringing me out. So everyone has a different approach. I can just tell you, we have, a we, we have uh, places in West Virginia, treatment centers called Recovery Point. Recovery Point uh, takes an absolutely clean, clean slate and goes with it. And these are all run by severe addicts, people who almost bottomed out. And they're all working and running these recovery points. They do not tolerate Suboxone. They do not tolerate Methadone. They do not tolerate any of that. And they've got a 68% basically cure rate. But they really work with these people and they monitor it. They're on 24-7, a minimum of 12 months. And that's what it takes when you have been addicted to the point that America's addicted and West Virginia's been addicted. But I, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough to say, oh, yeah, bring yeah. them down with uh, I, 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 Senator Hassan, I'm yeah, going to yeah. give you the last well, word. Yeah, I, I, will, I will say that we, what we know is that different people need different kinds of treatments. We also know that there's a whole secondary set of medical uh, problems like hep C and cardiac mm -hmm. problems that come from uh, ongoing addiction. So we need to be smart. We need to treat this as the disease it is. Uh, we also need to hold people accountable, which is why drug court programs with treatment options are so important. Uh, but we got a lot of work to do. Again, we're losing people every day to this horrible disease. Yeah. Senator Portman, well, Mike, I'll, just, I'll actually give you the last word. Yeah, well, look, I, I don't disagree with what was said. I just, I think, Again, going back to the drug companies and the need to come up with non-addictive pain medication, we also need better medication, and this is what CARA tries to incentivize through, uh, through some funding, to come up with other treatment options. Joe's talked about methadone and Suboxone, and I've heard the same thing from a lot of addicts. Uh, I think Maggie's right that it needs to be customized to the person. Uh, Vivitrol is now out there. Most of our drug courts in Ohio are using Vivitrol, which blocks the craving as opposed to you know, continuing the... Uh, the effects of, a, of an opioid, and, and that's been very successful for some, for some people. But it is incredible to me that we don't have more options out there for people to look at that are non-addictive options to get people through that difficult period of recovery. And um, I think that, again, if you look at this as a, in, in a broad sense, we got to go back to the core here. How do we stop people from overprescribing to getting addicted in the first place? Probably four to five heroin addicts in Ohio started on prescription drugs. And how do you come up with, therefore, non-addictive medications, and then at the other end, right. how do you come up with better, better therapies? And uh, if it's really an epidemic, which I believe it is, and we really have a national emergency, that ought to be part of the focus. Let me just say very, very briefly. briefly, very briefly, if it wasn't for the Washington Post article, what you all done, 
And I read it Sunday immediately when I read it, I called all my staff. I knew right then that uh, Congressman Marino was not the person to be leading the drug czar. There's no one in West Virginia would believe after that article, and then also you all collaborating with 60 Minutes, would have ever believed that he was going to be fighting for them. It was not personal against him whatsoever. But the position he's taken and how he was so involved was the wrong person. I applaud the president for moving as quickly as they're moving in a different direction. I think the uh, White House is sincere about this. Now it's time to take action. And I want to thank you all, because if you hadn't done that, this would still be simmering. Well, we appreciate the kind words, Senator, but th thank you for joining us today. Th thank all the senators for, for joining us. <laughs> Big hand for them. And when you get a chance, thank first responders. Too. Absolutely. And, and Senator Hassan makes a, a tremendous point. Thank, thank the first responders who are on a daily basis responding to, to, to people in crisis. Uh, and uh, we're going to move on now to the next portion of our program.